Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is the fifth interview. I've actually forgotten what the word is. Someone told me about it last time. <laughs> anyway, it's I'm joined here by Ben. How are you doing, Ben? Very good. I believe the word is pentalogy. Are you mean, <laughs> five works? And Should we could change that to bentalogy. Well, it's not really got the same ring to it. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> but look, how you doing, man? Uh, I always appreciate your time, as does um, the community, because this I ex I just said it before we went live there. Uh, I expected it to sort of slow down uh, with this process. Uh, kind of everything that's happened over this last week, we knew that meetings were happening. The Qatari delegation was there yesterday for 10 hours. Ineos and Sir Jim Ratcliffe is there as we speak. At, oh, I don't think he's Old Trafford anymore, but I think he's gone to see Carrington. They're having their conversations. A second bid is expected. Ben. Give us all, get, give us everything that we need to know because uh, it seems to be moving quite fast. Well, I think that the speed is not necessarily an indication that things are moving fast because you can read it two ways. And you may remember that when we last spoke, I said that there might be a stage three where a preferred bidder gets put into a period of exclusivity or multiple groups may be through in order to create competitive tension in stage three, and then there'll be a preferred bidder in a period of exclusivity. So if you read into the second bids coming in by the middle of next week as speed, then one theory is that a group stands out, and as a consequence, the process may move quicker than expected and could be wrapped up at some point in late April. Or, of course, the deadline for second offers has been moved forwards a little bit because another stage will be needed, which means although things have moved dramatically to get the second offers in before March is out, that may be for the purpose of having to squeeze in another stage, which might mean that right. more than one group goes through. And therefore, we may get a period of multiple bidders. And that could suggest that a number has not yet been hit that satisfies the Glazers. So I don't think this is about meeting with Sheikh Jassim and then deciding that bids need to come in a little bit earlier because things are moving in the right direction of wrapping up a quick sale, because that would be unfair, for example, to Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who at that point hadn't even met with Manchester United. I sense that yeah. there could be a further third stage whereby we have more than one group through competitive tension is drummed up. And as a consequence, to still get it done between now and the end of the season, or even before, everything just needs to move forwards a little bit in time scale. So it's very important to note that there's no clarity yet, and there won't be until the second offers come in. Scenario one, standout group, stage three, exclusive period. S scenario two, more than one group goes through a kind of a bidding war, a final offer in stage three, and then a preferred bidder and a period of exclusivity. And that's where we're okay. at at the moment in terms of the roadmap. Well, the uh, the delegate, the Qatari delegation uh, went to Old Trafford yesterday and to Carrington. They spent 10 hours there, which was it's a long old time. But I suppose when you're buying a five billion pound business, uh, 10 hours seems like a pretty relative time to actually talk it through. Uh, what, what can you tell us about... Um, because finally, we've got a little bit of clarity on on those involved. Uh, we, we sort of you you're mentioning that the president, who's going to be the president of the, of the Nine Two Foundation. Also, there was a, a man there from Bank of America. If you can just give us a little bit of insight into who was at the meeting or who who was part of the delegation representing Sheikh Jassim yesterday, and sort of how those conversations went. It's the takeover of tens, isn't it? Ten days originally to place the second bids. Ten Hag and Faith in him and of course we are now in a situation where i think we are basically going to have 10 hours of jim ratcliffe meetings much like sheikh jassim who was in there for 10 hours as well so everything has this 10 elements to it at this stage but the length of the meetings are not necessarily that significant but i think from qatar's point of view the sources who were familiar with the talks yesterday made it clear that those meetings were substantial and detailed 
And sources were telling me throughout the day that the delegation was very warmly welcomed. And on top of that, the meetings were, quote, very positive and very detailed. So that tells you that from Sheikh Jassim's side, he and his bid team, as we've known all along, very serious about purchasing 100% of Manchester United. So yesterday they arrived in the morning and it was very much a who's who from the world of banking in particular. Sheikh Jassim himself wasn't there, but that was no surprise, as I reported and I think said on this show the last time that we connected. It was always yeah. unlikely that he would attend yeah, in did. person, still too early in the process. So instead, we had a leading member of his bid team in Shazad Shabazz, who is the president of the 92 Foundation. And you may remember that the last time we spoke, I said we would get more clarity on the 92 Foundation. And yeah. there it is in the form of Shazad Shabazz, who has been earmarked for a key role within the group if they are successful. And I can go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment as we explain who the key players are. But his role is significant because he is a highly respected member of the investment and finance world and has 25 years previous experience at the Bank of America. And that's exactly what we saw from the delegation, a Bank of America theme. So Shabazz is somebody who is extremely well known in investment communities and has decades of experience working in capital markets and international banking. He was also the CEO of QI Vest and Emirates MDB. And the trust being placed in him is significant. He's not a figure that's only been parachuted in for the bid. He's somebody that is effectively going to represent the ownership group if Sheikh Jassim is successful and be far more day-to-day -day than Sheikh Jassim would be, which yeah. is why yesterday I compared him to Baird Agheg Bali at Chelsea, who represents Clear Lake Capital. So it's not thought that Shabazz will be given a Manchester United specific executive title or in-house role, he will effectively, if this group is successful, be a senior day-to-day -day figure representing the ownership group. But it's still quite fluid because obviously when you are trying to get a takeover done, you can't always create a roster of incoming executives, especially not if incumbents are already there. You have to show respect to who's within the Manchester United hierarchy. And that's why after a group gets in, as we saw with Chelsea, they would do a review and have a transition and then decide effectively who they want to keep and who potentially they want to replace. And at that yeah, point, yeah. the structure and the leadership team become more significant. But make no mistake, Shazad Shabazz is a heavyweight and anybody in this process from Manchester United, from Rain Group, will know who he is. And Rain Group will have dealt with him before. And having him there to lead on the delegation is highly significant. And then also Yasser Shah was present on behalf of the Bank of America. He's their MD and Bank of America will be, of course, advising Sheikh Jassim off the back of these presentations and meetings. And Ferdi Bakos was another member who was there. He's a legal corporate and investment advisor to Sheikh Jassim. So Shabazz and Bakos are the two key advisors and the ones going forwards that are basically going to be more day-to-day -day and more involved in the running of Manchester United Football Club if the Qatar group are successful, feeding back up to Sheikh Jassim. And then on top of the names that I have mentioned, we should also point out that there were lawyers present from McFarlane's and Sam Powers was there as well, who's the global head of technology, media and telecom at the Bank of America too. So these are individuals that know how to get deals done and know how to value accurately football clubs. And what they saw yesterday was a series of presentations from different departments at Manchester United showing future value 
to try and obviously help raise the price yeah. and also giving a understanding of how the recruitment team works, of how the commercial team works. And that's the kind of oddity about the dynamic. On the one hand, the presentations are pictures to show value and information that perhaps is not in the public domain. But on the other hand, they're almost selling themselves to a prospective new owner because they know that if that group comes in, their very departments may be changed from strategy all the way through to personnel. So this isn't only about fact finding and information and Q&As, which happened yesterday. It's also about relationship building. And that's a very significant aspect. So then flashing forwards to Sir Jim Ratcliffe, this is one of the main reasons why he decided that he wanted to attend in person today to make it absolutely clear that as a Manchester United fan and somebody that says he wants to put the heart of Manchester back into Manchester, he feels it very crucial to be there and to start building relationships with Manchester United staff in person, but also to, some would say, strengthen a relationship with Rain Group, because if we go back to Chelsea, Jim Ratcliffe entered the process late when Clear Lake Bowley were already in an exclusive period. Yeah. He did so outside of the Rain remit. And I think that is water under the bridge, but it can't hurt to be there in person talking all day to Rain representatives. And we expect the meetings to also go on relatively late, probably nine or 10 hours as well. And the big difference between Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Sheikh Jassim's approaches is that Sheikh Jassim has sent executives from the world of banking and finance and advisors and their heavyweights. And it's pretty much the best bench from that industry. Whereas yeah. with Jim Ratcliffe, it's Ineos in-house and it's a mix of business. All the co-founders are there and sport. So a slightly different approach. And you could argue that Sheikh Jassim's delegation had more experts to get a deal done in terms of negotiating lawyers, financial experts. That's a good point. But Jim Ratcliffe is showing face and is bringing football experts as well. So Jim Ratcliffe has himself. And on top of that, he's joined by his Ineos co-owners, Andy Curry and John Reese. That's the business side. And then there's the sport chair of Ineos, Rob Nevin, and the chairman of the sports arm of Ineos, Jean-Claude Blanc, which is quite intriguing because he it's used to be. <laughs> so Blanc will know a lot about the QSI side, even though that's not directly relevant to Sheikh right. Jassim, but there's crossover in personnel. So he might have a bit of intel into the strategy and approach of Sheikh Jassim's bid. So those meetings taking place at the moment, and no doubt they will also be briefed as very positive. And mm -hmm. there is full expectation that Jim Ratcliffe, much like Sheikh Jassim, will be making a second bid by the middle of next week. I think you, I think you made a, a pretty good point there in comparing how the two different bids are approaching this stage kind of from a different perspective with the Sheikh Jassim bid really focusing on maybe the financials with a little bit more scrutiny to actually get to that exact valuation, which is obviously the sticking point, right? And Ineos, and I, I don't think it's a, a, any, you mentioned there Jim Ratcliffe going himself. He knows that that's kind of part of his bid. Is, is, is his presence there, is his presence in Manchester. And that's going to be a, a strength of it if it is to become successful. In terms of these second bids going in, obviously we had the original Q1 deadline, right? Which is what they always said. By the end of, end of Q1, they hopefully get a, a sale done. Now, the, it's not outside the realms of possibility, is it, Ben, that by the end of Q1, there could be a, a, a preferred exclusive bidder. That the, it, what, Not a deal is done, but we kind of know who is likely to become the new owner of Manchester United. Well, no, two things. First of all, whether the Glazers want to sell outright, because whoever they put through, even if there's more than one group, if they're both outright bidders, it tells you that if this process is going to conclude with anything, it will be an outright sale. And obviously, if it's a minority group, then suddenly it's clear that the Glazers want to stay at the football club. I'd be surprised if an outright bidder is not put through. And if it's exclusive, then there's full clarity that they're hoping to sell 100% of the club. If they put through one of each, it tells you that there's a minority investor that has given the Glazers a high valuation and opportunity to sell, and they're offsetting that 
against an outright bidder. And if more than one group is put through, it will be to create that competitive tension to get the highest possible price. If a singular group is put through, then full due diligence can start and we will know categorically whether or not the Glazers have that appetite collectively in a unified sense to leave Manchester United. And if that scenario materialises, it's highly significant because it calms the mood around the fan base and arguably the stock market as well. Any clarity, I think, with the latter is important because the uncertainty is what can breed a drop in the stock market price. Any excitement, of course, can do the opposite and give it a kind of false spike. But as we've seen from when it was announced that Sheikh Jassim was interested through to now, that spike has gone all the way back down, even with Manchester United winning the League Cup. So clarity is going to be very important. And if we're purely talking in terms of the fan base mood and PR, if it's learnt that the preferred bidder is somebody that wants to buy 100% of the club, then I think at that point, the fan base will be a bit more settled and won't be as concerned about whether it's done today, tomorrow, next week or next month. And in that next stage, if it is a singular bidder in an exclusive period, and I've said many times to reiterate two options, could be straight through to exclusive with one group or could be more than one group with a view to creating some kind of competitive tension. But either way, once we get into the serious part of this process, full due diligence will take place. And when that happens, it can take a month, which would lean itself towards an earliest conclusion of in mid or late April, but it could take two or three months. And whoever becomes preferred bidder, whether it's in stage three or stage four, has that control to slow things down to some extent because they realize that they're the front runner. And this will be the other thing to look out for. Do Rain Group offset that as they did with Chelsea by having a lapsed period of exclusivity that's very short? Or do they make it a healthier period of exclusivity because they sense that all parties are moving in the right direction? And that's why these meetings are significant for everyone to basically start to get on the same page. And then with the number, as I've said many times, I wouldn't worry about what the club is going to sell for at this point because it's speculative and no offer has yet hit the Glazers' valuation, whether that's 6 billion, 7 billion, 8 billion. And there's gamesmanship because throughout this whole process, Those on the Manchester United side have been intentionally pushing for sky high numbers. And those on the buying sides have been valuing the club around the same number. And whether that is in the low four billions or the mid four billions, it doesn't really matter when it's indicative because offers can go up or down. Mm -hmm. But significantly, what's happened in the last two weeks or so is more data has been shared And there's a lot, obviously, of information about Manchester United out there that allows for groups from the outside in to put together an accurate picture. But what you don't know is pending commercial deals. You don't know about player bonuses. You don't know about anything new that Manchester United are planning on the recruitment side. You don't know about accurate, independent, valued costs for renovation of Old Trafford, not in terms of what the club see versus what you've judged from the outside. And that's why the second offer will allow a more accurate picture. And it is likely in the case of both Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Sheikh Jassim that those offers will go up. But if we're talking more broadly, offers can go up or down because this is like viewing a house. And I've said many times this analogy, you go in to an open house. And that's what the last two weeks of meetings have been all about. And in that open house, If you are an outright bidder, you want to buy the entire house. So you're looking around, you're seeing whether there's any black mold in the bathroom. You're working out whether there's cigarette stains on the carpet. And then you're saying, okay, based on what I've now seen, I'm satisfied that I'll go up or I'll stick to my valuation or I'll go down. And in this case, it's likely that the offers will go up. But are they going to be high enough to meet the number that the Glazers actually want rather than 
the gamesmanship like valuation that's been put out there to try and create a bidding war. And that's where we'll see who's bluffing. Is it the prospective buyers that have started low and then show their hand? Or is it the glazers that are briefing higher, but actually will settle for something like five or 5.5 billion, or even a little bit lower than that? And we're going to have to wait and see. And then with a minority investor, it's a little bit different because they walk into the open house and they're not looking to buy outright. Mm -hmm. They're effectively looking to rent with the Glazers as their landlord. And that means that the meetings and conversations, for example, with Elliot are very different because there has to be an element of coexistence. So it's not only about the highest number. It's not about cleaning that house and making it very alluring and appealing to try and get the highest possible number and then saying, great, the highest offer wins. Thank you very much. We'll now vacate the house. That's for Sheikh Jassim and also for Sir Jim Ratcliffe. But for a minority investor, they've got to live together. So there's a lot of different questions asked. How active is the minority investor going to be? Do they want to increase their stake over time? Do they want any kind of day-to-day -day involvement or are they more a strategic and silent partner? What's the stake in the first place? There's lots more questions because there has to be a balance and that balance is around an agreement on strategy, an agreement on dynamic, and of course, an agreement on cost as well. So those that are taking the meetings for minority and outright are valuing the club at 100% regardless so a minority investor is very useful if they value the club high, even if the Glazers don't want to do business with them. If they hit a number that's high for 100% of the club, even if they say they only want 1%, that can be used as leverage to go to other bids and say somebody values the club higher than you. But we're at a stage now where after all of these meetings, Rain Group and Manchester United will have a sense of two things. One, the people they're dealing with in a personal sense as well as a business sense. And two, the valuation they think is incoming from the second offers. And that will allow them to either put one group through or multiple groups through to move this process along as quick as they can. Well, you can't get a better roundup than that. Thank you very much, Ben. I, I, look, I'm, I'll be honest. I can't hide my excitement. Uh, I'm uh, At that point there, the one you, you just uh, sort of the penny dropped there. If we get to the point where at the end of March, the stories come out, and they've taken the Ineos bid through and the uh, Qatar bid through, and it's just those two, then the Glazers are looking to sell every single part of the club. They, they, they're going to leave. And at that point, it's going to be a big point of celebration for United fans, whether it goes... Uh, we, we've mentioned it. For a, for a last question here, just for the last two minutes, like due diligence is something that is, is said so often, right? We, we feel that... Well, we know that due diligence has come up to... well. I thought that this, that's why I thought it was going to slow down at this point. But is there still going to be a point of diving even further into the books in, in that third stage? Is that what you would expect? Well, generally within any sale, even deep into due diligence and a period of exclusivity, the price can go up or down because once you realize you've got the basics of a deal in place, then you're quibbling through lawyers over lots of things to get the best possible value. So full due diligence at football clubs, especially ones that are publicly listed, can be easier and quicker. So these groups at this stage, especially because they've had access to extra data now in the data room, have got a pretty clear picture of Manchester United. But it's not complete. And once it is complete, they'll then look at how best they can negotiate. And they may use, for example, an independent valuer that says that the redevelopment of Old Trafford is going to cost half a billion more than the club estimate. And as a consequence, they would like to bring the price down or they might discover tax liabilities or they may determine that there are commercial deals that they can't get out of that they don't think are fair market value. And as a right. consequence, they have less ability to bring in more commercial income. They may value the football club and say, now Cristiano Ronaldo's left, 
you're telling us that this is your digital following and you're putting this value on it. You're telling us that this is your global fan base and you're putting this value on it. You're telling us that you sell this amount of shirts. You're telling us that you'll get this amount of money from forthcoming things like preseason tours. But we believe you started this process when Cristiano Ronaldo was outgoing. And since he's left, we think that he was X amount of the club. And you can make lots of arguments. And many of the arguments may be debatable. But that's the point of a negotiation. And I'm not saying they're going to use that specific example. I just thought that using him is one clear way of explaining how the club has changed over the course of the last few months. Yeah. But there's a whole variety of different things. There's obviously Champions League football versus not Champions League football. There's lots of variables. So once you've got an agreement in principle for a number due diligence takes place as you try and get the specific terms. And as you then comb through, you may determine that there is scope to get a slightly better deal. So Chelsea, for example, started at about 2.5 billion as the base price, plus 1.75 billion in pledged investment. And then in the latter days, not even weeks or months, days, it was decided the price would drop from 2.5 to 2.3. And 100 million was also set aside off the price and the frozen funds, which went to the government in order to cover any tax liabilities because it was done at such speed that the incoming group, Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital, couldn't necessarily anticipate everything because there was an urgency. And that's what I mean about slowing it down, that if in getting to, let's just say, 95% of an agreed deal, the extra 5% takes another few weeks beyond the anticipated deadline or date when everyone wants it done, then the preferred bidder can just control the situation because they don't want to rush through a record-breaking sale of this magnitude yeah. over a few days. And they don't have to because they've got a lot more control because they're either in a period of exclusivity or even if it's about to lapse, they will know categorically that they're the front runner. And I don't think if it was Sheikh Jassim and Sir Jim Ratcliffe was waiting or vice versa, that the other group would necessarily be particularly happy being the backup and just lingering around in case anything falls through. Of course, they both want the club. But in this type of transaction with this amount of stages, it's very unlikely that after an exclusive period is entered, a sale will fall through. Whereas with a normal takeover, a singular group often enters into a period of exclusivity and things do get delayed and fall through. I've given the example of John Textor at Leon. It needed a series of missed deadlines before he eventually got in. But mm. this is so rigid and so much has been looked at by the groups already and meetings have taken place and Rain are very experienced having done the Chelsea takeover that if it gets to exclusivity, it is highly, highly unlikely that that will not lead to an acquisition or an investment taking place simply because the process has been designed to have less surprises and that's why Rain are so valuable within it. So the other groups will know once a preferred bidder is name that in all likelihood, not definitively, but in all likelihood, their race is run. And that's why before a preferred bidder is picked, we might see more than one go through to create that competitive tension. But as you say, the most exciting thing for the fan base is that the next stage should reveal the hand of the Glazers in terms of minority or outright. And that will probably calm down the fan base a little bit to understand where the process is heading. And then it's just about finding the group. And Qatar are extremely confident in their valuation, but also in the team they've built around the 9-2 foundation. And as I revealed exclusively yesterday, Shabazz is important because he is going to be that Baird Ageg Bali representative of the 9-2 foundation, probably still holding a title within the 9-2 foundation rather than a specific title at Manchester United. But it's too early to tell because yeah. they've got to get in first. Then they've got to assess the business. Then they've got to decide where there's actually a vacancy because I do expect them to be highly respectful to anybody from the Manchester United leadership team that remains should the Glazers depart. And then with Sir Jim Ratcliffe 
I think it's also important to say we didn't mention Sir Dave Brailsford, who no, is also no. one of the key advisors and is present today as well. He is not being earmarked as having a Manchester United specific role either. He's very much being seen as an advisor to Sir Jim Ratcliffe on behalf of Ineos, one of his most trusted sports advisors. But again, these are not people that are going to be parachuted in to yeah. Manchester United chief executive style roles. First of all, they'll assess the business. Second of all, they will give fair assessment in that to existing staff. And then they'll decide who they need and whether appointments are necessary, replacements are necessary, new roles are necessary, or representatives on behalf of the group that comes in are sufficient. And Chelsea's a whole mix of those things. Baird Agag Bali represents the majority ownership group. Todd Bowley came in as a co-owner and made himself interim sporting director and chairman. But the other thing as well that people don't quite realise always is just that there are scenarios where those who are close to the old regime or the Glazers may also not want to stay at Manchester United. So it works both ways. It's not just about a new group coming in with a new plan and a new strategy and new spending and a new approach to recruitment and commercial. It's also about those within Manchester United, particularly those that have worked closely with the Glazers at seniorship level, uh, senior leadership level, yeah. deciding whether or not they want to stay and whether they're the right fit for anybody new coming in. So that's way further down the line. It's yeah, disrespectful sure. almost to people at Manchester United to be speculating. But what we know is that the Sheikh Jassim bid means business with their hired names for the bid. And a lot of them are not just parachuted in to win. They're parachuted in to be part of the project. And with Sir Jim Ratcliffe, my understanding is that he wants control of the club, but again, he doesn't see himself as being day-to-day -day in Manchester, only doing Manchester United. This is very mm -hmm. much Ineos. So it'll be interesting to see if he's successful, who becomes the day-to-day -day lead, because that is the difference. The Sheikh Jassim names are, are very much long-term. If they win, many of them will be heavily involved in some capacity representing the 9-2 foundation in particular. Whereas with Sir Jim Ratcliffe, it's three Ineos co-owners that will remain three Ineos co-owners if they're successful. And it's a series of sports experts that are advising on the bid. But again, it's not being intimated by sources that they will necessarily be dropped into a Manchester United in-house role. And as yeah. a consequence, I think that Jim Ratcliffe will have to work out who he needs externally and um, work upon that recruitment after he's successful. So there is a slight contrast between the yeah. two. It's exciting times as far as Manchester United fans are concerned because whatever happens next, in the next week to two weeks, there should be clarity as to the Glazers' hand, which is one of the most important parts of this whole process. And I hope that hand remains empty of the keys of Manchester United at the end of it. I don't know why I was going with that one. But look, Ben... You're an absolute legend. Thank you so much for that insight. Genuinely, it really helps, especially understanding the different personnel of the long termness of that Sheikh Jassim and the, and the 9 2 Foundation compared to effectively Ineos going into Manchester United. And, and we'll speak about that in part six, no doubt, because this, this, uh, this, <laughs> this series hasn't quite finished yet. And there's still so much more to go. But Ben, I, I always appreciate your time. Make sure you follow Ben on Twitter at Jacobs Ben. Uh, and no doubt you'll be back here at some point soon. But, mate, I really appreciate your time and uh, thanks for the insight into everything that's gone on in this week. All the best, Sam. And let's see what stage two into stage three brings. <laughs> Who knows how many stages we're going to get.